All right. Thank you again. I'd like to invite uh, first Professor Matthew Hopper um, to the podium. Uh, the paper he'll be giving this morning is entitled After Slavery, Captured Slave Ships and the Relocation of Liberated Africans to Indian Ocean Islands, 1808 to 1897. The floor is yours. Thank you very much to the organizers uh, and all of the people working behind the scenes to make this conference possible. Uh, it's, a very, it's, a, it's very much a pleasure for me to be here in Sharjah and to be here at the conference, so I thank you all. On August 10th, 1860, the HMS Brisk, a British Royal Navy sloop of war patrolling the waters between Mozambique and Madagascar, spotted the Cuban slave ship Manuela sailing from Zanzibar to Havana. The Brisk pursued and captured the slave ship and on boarding discovered that the Manuela was carrying 846 enslaved Africans. It was the largest slave ship ever captured in the Indian Ocean and the second largest slave ship ever captured. The African captives were then taken to Mauritius where they became liberated Africans, the term that British officials applied to Africans who were removed from slave ships by the Royal Navy. But they were not simply released on the island to live independently. Instead, they were registered and placed into indentured servitude as laborers, domestic servants, or apprentices to trade for terms up to 14 years. The captives aboard the Manuela were part of a global phenomenon. Between 1808 in 1897, the British Royal Navy captured more than 1,500 slave ships and removed more than 200,000 enslaved Africans from vessels in the Atlantic and Indian Ocean. At least 22,000 of these Africans were captured on slave ships in the Indian Ocean. As in the Atlantic world, liberated Africans in the Indian Ocean were never simply released near their place of capture. Instead, they were transported to the closest court uh, for adjudication. In the case of the Manuela, the ship was taken to Mauritius. There, the case could be tried, slave ships could be condemned, and then in the enslaved Africans could be placed into contracts for indenture. Although the act of abolition in 1807 envisioned indenture as a method to provide training and marketable skills, the reality was that most liberated Africans were placed into menial positions as agricultural laborers or domestic servants in ways that often emulated the lives of enslaved Africans in the region. In the Indian Ocean, liberated Africans were transported to seven main port cities, Cape Town, Mauritius, Zanzibar, Mombasa, Aden, Seychelles, and Bombay. And smaller numbers were also taken to Muscat, Reunion, Sawakin, and Durban, places where their labor was in demand. And while they all became known as liberated Africans, they were never simply freed. They were indentured to British subjects in port cities for terms of up to 14 years, and their names and descriptions were recorded in registers, which served simultaneously as methods of accounting for naval prize money, but also as a method for surveillance against those who might abscond from their indenture. After adjudication, liberated Africans were frequently transported to British port cities on islands. These Indian Ocean islands uh, controlled uh, by the British, such as Mauritius, the Seychelles, and Zanzibar, um, became the sites for their relocation. In fact, most of the liberated Africans captured in the Indian Ocean were taken to these islands. At times, liberated Africans tested the limits of British imperial attitudes towards slavery, and at other times, they provided a symbolic justification for imperialism. The question of disposing, and I'm putting this term in uh, quotes, it was the unfortunate term used in the 19th century of liberated Africans presented a persistent problem for imperial officials who were equally wary of releasing survivors near their sites of capture where they feared they might be massacred or re-enslaved. 
as they were for paying for their upkeep. Mortality rates among liberated Africans in the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean remained high. In the Indian Ocean in the 1860s, at least one third of liberated Africans died within just a few years of their arrival in these port cities. And in each of these places where they were taken, the lives of liberated Africans often mirrored the lives of enslaved Africans. They were renamed, reclothed, converted to foreign religions, taught new languages, some were married off in group ceremonies, and many labored to produce cash crops for export for global markets. This irony was not lost on local populations in the Indian Ocean. In Zanzibar, for example, liberated Africans at Christian missions were popularly known as Watumwa wa Wangereza, the slaves of the British. In this paper, I explore the lives of liberated Africans on three Indian Ocean islands, and I examine the paradoxical nature of British colonial, uh, the col colonial mindset toward liberated Africans. And in the end, I argue that by the late 19th century, the callous treatment received by liberated Africans reflected a growing influence of scientific racism and a pessimism about the project of abolition. So I'll pause here to speak extemporaneously from some slides rather than read from my script. These are the 10 locations where uh, liberated Africans were taken in the, in, the ocean, in the Indian Ocean. And I'm gonna focus on, for the purposes of this conference, on those islands in the Indian Ocean where liberated Africans uh, were taken. Um, slave ships were captured between Bombay and the Cape of Good Hope. Many of them were in this region here, the Mozambique Channel, which if we zoom in on, also allows us to see all three of these islands. So in the 19th century, Initially, liberated Africans were primarily taken here. In the second half of the 19th century, they're primarily captured uh, to the north of this region, and it becomes an imperative uh, to transport them somewhere else. So beginning in 1861, they begin to go to the Seychelles. They'll later be taken to Mauritius again. And by the 1870s, most are being taken to Zanzibar, where many are then relocated to Mombasa. And there are also many who are transported to Aden, where some are transported then to, to Bombay. Let me just say a few things about the process of capturing slave ships in the Indian Ocean. Just as in the Atlantic, the British Royal Navy would fire warning shots uh, to get slave ships to lower their sails and stop. And they were doing this to enforce treaties that the British government had made with European powers and then later with Indian Ocean powers. Uh, in an attempt to eliminate the East African slave trade, which was popularly known in Europe as the uh, Muslim or Arab slave trade, uh, something of a misnomer. The ships would be uh, boarded. Sometimes they would run ashore to evade the British. Sometimes by the time the British uh, Royal Navy arrived on the shore, the ships would be empty. But most often the ships would be boarded uh, on the high seas Here's a photograph from Zanzibar in the 1870s, which I believe is the only surviving photograph of a slave ship being boarded in the Indian Ocean. A photograph, uh, this one dates from Zanzibar, from the uh, HMS London after 1874. After they were taken off of the slave ship, the slave ships were very often uh, sunk by burning. And then the captives would sometimes be photographed, uh, such as this one especially in the 1870s and by the 1880s, large groups were sometimes photographed uh, as they were handed over to missionaries or as they were assembled on the decks of, of uh, Royal Navy vessels. Afterward, the ship would be taken to a port of adjudication where they, the case of the slave ship would be tried at a vice admiralty court or court of mixed commission. In the case of Zanzibar, testimonies of, uh, of translators as well as the captives themselves would be heard alongside those of accused slave traders and Royal Navy officers who were engaged in the boarding of these ships. And subsequently, all this time, the Africans are kept aboard the Dow, or aboard the slave ship, or aboard the British Royal Navy vessel. And then eventually they would be relocated. And often they would be relocated to islands in the Indian Ocean. So here is the HMS Lyra arriving at, at, uh, at the Seychelles in the 1860s. In the first half of the 19th century, most of the captured slave ships were captured in the Mozambique Channel around the Cape of Good Hope, and most liberated Africans ended up on the island of Mauritius or in Cape Town. 
approximately 5,000 in the period between 1808 and 1827. And then there's a lull of 11 years when no slave ships are captured, and this is in part due to the scandalous report of the Committee of Eastern Inquiry, which found abuses of liberated Africans and lots of profiteering um, happening in a period between 1827 uh, and 1839. There are no slave ships captured in, in the Indian Ocean. And in 1839, what's called the Palmerston Act, which is the beginning of the, what's called the Equipment Clause, which gave the British um, universal rights to seize Portuguese slave ships, regardless of its violation of international law, went into effect and also created a court of mixed commission at the Cape of Good Hope. And again, another approximately 4,000 liberated Africans were taken aboard slave ships in this period. But a transformation occurred in the year 1858. Prior to 1858, there were essentially no patrols around uh, Zanzibar. And in 1858, the HMS Lyra arrived and began making captures in the Mozambique Channel and the region around Zanzibar. Its earliest captures were complete disasters. Uh, it captured a slave ship containing 115 enslaved Africans and attempted to take them to the Cape of Good Hope, but the ship was lost in a storm and all 115 Africans perished in 1858. That didn't stop the Royal Navy from submitting a claim to get prize money for the tonnage of the ship that was captured. But beginning in 1860, the HMS Lyra began to make successful captures. It captured a ship, uh, the Manuela, uh, shortly after the Manuela, and that ship was also taken uh, to, to Mauritius. And in 1861, it began making successful runs to the Seychelles, where it was found that the survival rates were significantly higher, which was attributed to the climate of the Seychelles. So beginning in 1861, large numbers of captures were taken uh, to the Seychelles, and the Seychelles end up becoming unique uh, in that not only are large numbers arriving and surviving, they're also photographs. Uh, I believe the only instance in which the registers of liberated Africans contain uh, actual mugshots or photographs of liberated Africans, which I'll show you momentarily. Throughout the 1860s, liberated Africans continue to be taken to the Seychelles, but beginning in 1865, large numbers also began to be taken uh, to Aden, some were subsequently taken to Mauritius, uh, and in the 1870s, large numbers were taken to Zanzibar. So I'd like to say something about each of the three islands that received large numbers of, in, of uh, liberated Africans in the 19th century. And I'll start with Mauritius, which is the first of these islands to receive liberated Africans, almost immediately after the island was seized from the French during the Napoleonic Wars. One of the wonderful things we have as historians when looking at the story of liberated Africans are the registers of liberated Africans uh, in the Indian Ocean, which are meticulously uh, kept at Mauritius and the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and we have very detailed accounts, uh, often of the names, sometimes the names of parents, uh, the age, sex, and also, interestingly, distinguishing marks. And many of these can be compared with 19th century ethnographies and patterns of facial scarification, tattooing, um, uh, and, and other marks can be compared with ethnographic research from Brazil, uh, from Mauritius, um, and Mozambique, uh, in order to identify uh, the uh, hints at the ethnic origins of these captives taken to Mauritius in the early 19th century. Subsequently, they would be placed into indentures. Large numbers were taken almost immediately after the island was uh, seized from the French in the Napoleonic Wars and numbers continue to be taken through the 1860s. But as I mentioned, they're never simply released on shore to live independently. They're always placed into contracts for indenture. So here is an indenture contract from Mauritius. They're formulaic, but they indenture, especially children, for lengthy periods, up to 14 years. And these liberated Africans are also entered into registers. Their names are kept, and sometimes these names reflect their uh, ethnic origins, they are their birth names, but other times they include Europeans' name, names which are assigned to them, apparently in random alphabetical order, as you can see from the register here, where men are given names like Andrew, Benjamin, Charles, David, Ernest, Frederick, George, in alphabetical order, assigned to them apparently at random. In theory, they were to be given marketable skills through training. In reality, as you can see here, the vast majority were assigned to be domestic servants or to labor in agriculture, to French planters who were desperate for their uh, labor after the abolition of uh, slavery. Uh, 
I'll say a few things about the Seychelles and very briefly mention uh, Zanzibar before I close. Beginning with the arrival of the HMS Lyra in 1861, liberated Africans were taken in large numbers to the Seychelles. The registers here are unique because they actually include photographs and some, most of these are of young children and you can see that they're placed in front of a white, white, whitewashed backdrop wall. But as the younger children um, are seated on a chair, you can actually see the youngest ones, you can actually see the, the chair behind them. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of examples of ships that were captured in the 1870s and taken to the Seychelles. We know from the location recorded in the High Court of Admiralty records uh, where these ships were captured. So here's one that was captured en route between Mozambique and Madagascar, and the Africans on board were taken to the Seychelles. Here's another one that was taken near the Comoros Islands and then taken to the Seychelles, and here are the registers of those liberated Africans. They include birth names, sex, age, stature, and height in feet and inches, and of course these precious photographs, which are few and far between for the Indian Ocean, but because this period takes us into later 19th century, we do have some photography, which makes these sources uh, truly unique. And many of them are haunting photographs of young children, um, and often you can see the chair that they're sitting on uh, behind them. I'm gonna, in this, for the sake of time, skip a story about uh, Henry Morton Stanley complaining about the treatment, getting some negative attention for uh, liberated Africans. This leads to the creation of a CMS mission on Zanzibar, which you know, is, is known as Venstown. Uh, here, missionaries put the liberated Africans to work, planting crops for export, things like vanilla, and those trees are still there. Children were especially helpful for the harvesting of vanilla, which is a very fragile uh, crop. Um, but the mission there uh, was an industrial school, just like the industrial schools for liberated Africans in, in Bombay, as well as in South Africa. And these uh, were primarily children who were then extracted from plantations and then made to produce uh, cash crops for export. Although interestingly, the missionaries themselves had very little training in how to produce or harvest uh, these plants. Uh, but the trees are still there, and you can still visit. It's now a, a UNESCO heritage site, and you can see Venstown today. And finally, I'll just close with uh, Zanzibar, which I only have time to mention uh, very briefly in the final minutes here, uh, in part in hopes that I'll get invited to the Zanzibar conference, which I don't have enough time today to get to the Zanzibar uh, material. Uh, but by the 1870s, the majority of captures were made in the area in the immediate vicinity of Zanzibar. The HMS London was present off the coast of Zanzibar from 1875 to 18, uh, 80, 1884. And in, during that period, large groups of captures were um, widely publicized in 19th century uh, uh, illustrated news uh, articles as well as in the subscri seeking subscriptions by missionaries for additional support at the CMS as well as the UMCA missions uh, in Zanzibar. Um, and what I argue in the, in the broader paper is the treatment, the callous treatment, often abuse, at each of these three island sites reflects a broader problem in the history of abolition in the Indian Ocean. And so what I argue um, elsewhere in this, the broader project in the, uh, from which this uh, paper comes, uh, that, um, that at, I'm interested in the intersection of race, anti-slavery, and imperialism, this age of what I'm calling late abolition. By the late 19th century, the callous treatment of liberated Africans reflected a growing influence of scientific racism and a general pessimism about the project of abolition. Colonial officials, missionaries, and naval officers who were tasked with protecting liberated Africans often disparaged and abused them. Historians, including Richard Hussey and Catherine Hall and Andrew Porter, have demonstrated in the decades after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire, 1834-1838, uh, especially after the Indian Mutiny, the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica, 1865, British abolitionist movements declined in membership and British intellectuals increasingly turned to the language of race to explain and justify the inequalities and persistent differences between peoples. As Kay Anderson, Colin Kidd, and George Stocking have shown, in the mid-19th century, archeological discoveries, which coincided with the peak of the Royal Navy's anti-slave trade activities in the Indian Ocean, challenged European theories about the antiquity of the earth, as well as the unity of humankind and stimulated new theories of scientific racism. The treatment of liberated Africans whose numbers swelled in the Indian Ocean world in the years after 1858, the treatment they received from imperial officials, missionaries, and naval officers reflected perceptions actively shaped by debates about race back home in Europe about human difference. 
New scientific theories of race became entangled with colonial encounters to shape perceptions of what kinds of people were entitled to freedom. Late abolitionism struggled to reconcile the optimism of earlier radical enlightenment and abolitionist ideals of freedom and equality with the growing concerns about the effectiveness of abolition and who should receive it. As Andrew Porter explains, disappointment in developing ideas about insurmountable racial and cultural differences caused even the most compassionate to adjust their sights downward. If British treatment of liberated Africans in the Indian Ocean appears in retrospect to have been calloused, it's at least partially because Africans were increasingly deemed neither to understand nor to deserve the freedom that the British officials were working to provide. By the late 19th century, any former pretensions toward equality were gone and liberated Africans were deemed to be free but not equal. So I'll close with this final image uh, here of these uh, three islands as really central to the story of abolition in the 19th century Indian Ocean and central to the story uh, of liberated Africans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Matthew. Um, I'd like now to ask um, Al Johara Athani to please come to the stage. Thank you. Apologies, uh, slight technical difficulties uh, <laughs> happening at the start. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Africa Institute and its organizers uh, for this wonderful conference uh, that's being hosted today. Uh, I'll be speaking on, the, on Indian Ocean slavery state and display practices. Uh, sorry, this isn't, yeah. Uh, on legacies and representations of slavery in Qatari and Zanzibari museums. So traditional understandings of museums as a nationalistic temple of culture doesn't, doesn't exclusively hold true today as seen in the cases of slavery museums. I'll be discussing, uh, which is sort of the topic that I'll be discussing today, but this still remains um, as institutions concurrently impacted by social and political and economic context that they're in, while yielding the power of establishing narratives of the past and present in the public imagination, and constructing particular taxonomies, affecting the manner through which events and situations are read and understood. In the cases of both Zanzibar and Qatar, local governments have placed a significant emphasis on museums and historical sites. In both places, slavery and its history has become a subject for discussion. Uh, in both public and academic arenas. In Zanzibar, essentially being the focus of the majority of historical tourist sites from the Anglican Christchurch Cathedral and the slave market and a museum, and in Qatar, we have the Bin Jalmud House Museum, which is part of a sort of greater Msherab House Museums project, uh, which focuses on slavery in the region. What I aim to discuss today with you uh, is the different approaches each take in their depiction of slavery. In Zanzibar and Qatar, both are considered important sites of interrogation due to their unique statuses as hosts of museums dedicated to Indian Ocean slavery. The only other sites that do this in the region 
uh, are in Pondicherry, where a former slave hospital has been turned into an exhibit site, a part of a greater historical museum, VL project, as well as a recently opened uh, museum in Mauritius in 2020, which is the International Slavery Museum. I've also heard discussion, although uh, I'm not quite sure of the status of it, uh, but there is one that I think is being developed in Oman as well. Uh, but again, I'm not sure of the status of this uh, in particular. Beyond that, the only other major slavery museum that exists in Asia is the House of Sharing, which opened its doors in late 2017, which focuses on acts of sexual slavery conducted by the Japanese military uh, and the plight of the comfort women in contemporary South Korea during the Second World War. Zanzibar's main island, uh, Nguja, and Qatar present two very different approaches to tackling the same reality, which is of slavery in the region. With one site, the one in Zanzibar, uh, positioning itself as a site and a center of export, as well as the domestic exploitation of slave labor, while in Qatar, as a position of an importer, is situated, and is situated in a different manner where the narrative is, uh, is slightly varied. In the case of Zanzibar, we see a more direct and perhaps even a touristic past approach where the majority of historical, music, historical tourism is narrated and framed actually around uh, the island slave history, not only from the island's main museum, the Peace Memorial Museum, but also the most popular and most visited exhibit located in the Anglican church uh, slash former slave market complex, which, is being, which has been turned into a form of open air museum. In Qatar, on the other hand, this is part of one of, uh, which is part of one of the main slave importing regions in the Indian Ocean, as we see in, <laughs> in, in our earlier paper by Professor Hopper. Uh, the museum presents a juxtaposing perspective, both in terms of form and in terms of content, where the narrative of slave labor dependent history which adopts a past in the present approach when discussing the history and impact of slavery and is isolated and restricted to conversations in this institution alone. In terms of Zanzibar, there are three key types of exhibits that exist. There are the archeological sites, such as uh, the Mangapwani Coral Cave, the Mangapwani Slave Chambers, and a state-built museum, which is a Peace Memorial Museum as well as the sort of open air museum that's dedicated to slavery, which is located on the site of the Anglican church complex. As we know from uh, Jonathan Glassman's War of Worlds, War of Words, uh, that the ideas of a racial state had its seeds during the Amani conquest and cannot solely be blamed as a consequence of British colonialism that culminated ultimately in the events of 1964. He argues, for example, that many of the contemporary categories seen today, which includes racialized distinctions, Arab, Indian, African, natives to Zanzibar, Africans from the mainland originated pre-colonialism, but had become increasingly polarized during that period. And many of these divisions and categories remain predominant today, despite the period prior to the events of 1964, where there was a competing ideology to that, which is described above or earlier. On the one hand, there's a you know, you have the Afro-Shirazi party's view of islanders and mainlanders uniting on the basis of race against uh, what is perceived as Arab aliens. And then you have the ideas of the intelligentsia of Zanzibar, national, nationalist party, who aimed at superseding ideas of necessarily Arab hegemony, but that both had been impacted by Ustarabu, uh, which is trying to evade the term's literal meaning of becoming Arab, which had become almost synonymous with civilization. And instead, they argued that islanders should be united together uh, in an act that demonstrated their superiority to the benighted plight of the people of the African interior. Much of the island's history told to tourists, uh, with tourism being the second most important sector after agriculture, uh, based on, historically based on cloves, uh, which is an industry in itself founded on slave labor and seaweed farming. Uh, found on plagues written, found on plaques written in both Swahili and in English in front of what the government describes as legally protected historical monuments, narrated by local guides, present a narrative that overtly and explicitly relate to the island's slave trading past. Uh, 
This openness is in contrast to any of the individual wishes to strike up a conversation with locals regarding slavery, where it remains a taboo subject outside of this tourist industry. The main entities involved in the tourism industry include the governments of both Tanzania and Zanzibar, UNESCO with their slave route project, uh, which originally intended to focus on transatlantic slavery, which also uh, I think is worth noting in terms of the narratives, ideas that are formed and what is funded, as well as the in Zanzibar International Film Festival. As a number of international NGOs, profiteers of the tourism industry from tour companies to hotels, and outside of the capital also, we also see uh, four major historical sites that are the most publicized and most frequented by tourists, which I mentioned earlier, including the sites at Mangapwani, Maharubi Palace, Imtoni Palace, and the Khadiji per Persian Baths. The two sites located in Mangapwani are considered historically significant in the state due to their roles in emphasizing the slaving industry, the slave trading history and industry uh, on the islands, whereas present, their presented in narratives were they were seemingly exclusively conducted by Arabs, who are described with the prefix Romani. Further distancing them from a local Zanzibari context where much of this was, where all of this was occurring really. The first site contains a description which states that these caves were allegedly used to conceal slaves post-abolition because of the convenience of the location due to its relative proximity to the beach. Despite the use of the term alleged on the board, it's regarded as undisputed by guides who I encountered during these site visits and who had based the claim on local knowledge. In the second site of the underground slave chambers during a visit uh, a few years ago, the guide had taken us down and had demonstrated how so many people were kept in that location, how they were awaiting transportation by Arab traders, yet counter narratives to these claims also do exist even by the people in Zanzibar themselves. Yet, this is a perspective that the main audience for these sites, which are tourists, don't hear. Indeed, uh, one key example was during a conversation with Professor Abdul Sharif, uh, where I had learned of an elderly woman who's identified as being of Arab descent, who claims this area was her ancestral land and that the slave chambers were not actually slave chambers, but were essentially underground ovens used to dry fruits and particularly coconuts. And that many other locals were also aware of this. The ruins of Mahrubi and Mtoni palaces, as well as the Kadichi Persian Baths, turn our attention to a non-exporting form of slavery, which is concubinage. Upon visiting all three sites, all introductions were provided by guides, as well as descriptions of the chambers surrounding the relationship with the sultans and their concubines, um, of all the sort of figures of how many slaves they owned, and anecdotes such as how they were able to be swayed to the point of bribery and even post-abolition by the gift of a new concubine. These discourses emphasize a sense of moral bankruptcy, uh, corruption, decadence, and even hypocrisy by patronizing an institution that was supposed to have been abolished. In the case of Mtoni, this goes even further, whereby Tony Bennett describes uh, a tourist past which is the distinct similarities between the ways in which Disneyland and open air museums also organize how their visitors negotiate and experience relations between their constructed interiors and the outside world, including the use of costume work, museum workers who are mediating the relations between the visitors and the reconstructed historical milieu. Visitors to Mtoni are provided with a costumed performance of Tarab music and are taken on a tour by a guide dressed as Sultan Sayyid Said all run by nearby Mtoni Marine Hotel. Most notably, however, in the discussion of representations of slavery in Zanzibar is perhaps the Anglican Church Complex, which is located within Stonetown, a historic area of the capital and built in the 19th century. This particular complex holds a slave memorial that is the most visited exhibit and one where more effort and importance is placed upon it than the Peace, Mo Peace Memorial Museum. And it's located in town, which sees sort of very, the Peace Memorial Museum is located in town where, in an area which doesn't receive a lot of foot traffic, uh, despite being sort of the main museum, uh, officially, of the island. And that in itself also places a significant, a significant part of its story on slavery, 
After paying an entrance fee, a local guide would take tourists on a tour. The first place they're taken to is inside the cathedral itself, where the guide would describe the history built in the 1870s on the former slave market. And the description of the architecture of the building, most notably the significance of a wooden cross, which is said to have been derived from a tree in Zambia under which David Livingston's heart was buried itself, and the relationship to its founder, Bishop Edward Steer, to abolition on the island. You're provided with uh, descriptions of how uh, of these underground slave chambers that are located there, which consist of two small dark basement rooms uh, with slits for windows and raised cement slabs lining the walls. Guides inf inform visitors that these rooms were used to hold slaves before they were sold, providing graphic details of disease, of starvation, and of suffocation. The two chambers, visitors are told, are only two examples, and that the building in which it was held, which later became a hospital, had previously contained many such rooms. The numbers provided regarding how many slaves were held in each of the chambers regularly varied depending on the visits, but most were written out in chalk on the walls, 75 for the larger chamber with children and 55 for the smaller chamber with children. When questions on the logic of keeping slaves in such a situation where they would be subject to disease and death, um, the response I received from one guide was that the traders wanted them to die. Again, also the logic of this uh, needs to be interrogated. Why would a commodity be subject to, uh, to a condition where they would die? Afterwards, visitors are taken to see a sculpture outside which depicts slaves chained together. The guides describe these chains around the statues as originals. And finally, visitors are led to an exhibition space where they're left alone to read large block letters, a uh, large block text of, of uh, a large block of text of the history interspersed with occasional images. The exhibition space is completely comprised of poster boards which narrate a history of slavery in both English and Swahili, beginning in the 1800s early 1800s, many of what's presented in the text is nuanced, discussing inter-African slave trade, um, the impact of global ivory markets, and the increased demands it placed on slaves to transport the additional ivory. A discussion of the trade route and acknowledgement of Kilwa as a main trading site, which in, arguably is one of the, is probably the main trading port as opposed to Zanzibar in certain periods as well as a variety of parties involved in buying slaves that were not uniquely Arabs, but also consisted of Zanzibari residents and merchants from various places in the Indian Ocean, including India, Réunion, Mauritius, as well as various uh, French territories. This is a stark contrast that emerges between the rhetoric espoused by the guides and the writing on the poster boards concerning the history of slavery in the region. The prose was simple, but provided a lot of detail and was evidently written by an academic, uh, but no one on the site could tell me who, <laughs> who actually wrote these poster boards. Um, and there were scans and transcriptions of translations of primary text sources, which, were accompanied, uh, which accompanied many of the boards. And instead, instead of focusing on this kind of history that's narrated on these poster boards that are more nuanced and more complex, what you have uh, are the guide's narratives, uh, which has aligned with the discourse at other sites. None of my visits had rendered any conversation beyond Arabs as unique actors in the slave trade in any of the guide's explanations and who are described as an imposing foreign force and all of the site visits have comprised of a format that's targeted towards tourists who comprise the vast majority of visitors. Guides are available to conduct these tours in a variety of languages, English, French, German, Italian, Spanish, Russian, uh, and even when you're booking a ticket at the ticket booth, they will ask you what language do you prefer your guide, uh, your guide speak to you in. Or even on the phone when you make a booking, the same question is asked. Many historians have demonstrated the problems with this dominant narrative told towards visitors uh, to the site, and one of the most significant was that of the underground rooms that they claim are slave chambers built 20 years after abolition. That the main slave market in, in Zanzibar's main island was located outside of Stonetown, and that it was a separate above-ground structure that held slaves. <laughs> 
Now, moving on to the Qatari context, there are three main sites for historical exhibits. That's El Zabara, the archaeological site, World Heritage Site, the Mushrib House Museums, of which Bin Jilmud House Museum, the Slavery Museum is a part, and the National Museum. What we find is that Qatar takes a very different approach from Zanzibar in discussing slavery, despite it being a very socially taboo subject as well. And in the case of Qatar, the narrative becomes isolated in a small, almost tangential museum uh, in order to maintain a traditional museum narrative in the larger two projects, the National Museum and then Al Zubara, which aim to construct and elevate a narrative of a more glorious nationalistic past. In the Bin Jilmud House Museum, which is the one in, intended to be visited first within this complex of four museums, uh, examines the Indian Ocean slave trade, which includes Qatar and the rest of the Gulf, and its abolition. The other three museums that are part of the project include Company House, which discusses local petroleum industry workers and uh, the stories of their families, Valdwani House, a preserved home, which explores life pre-oil, and uh, Mohammed bin Jassim House, which examines the Mshayrib's past, the, the actual past of the site, and present concerns around sustainability. These museums are considered to be the ones that deal with more sensitive topics, including the subject of slavery. Um, and I argue that despite its seeming image of a state acknowledgement of such taboo subjects, what's instead happening within this kind of conversation is, uh, it's, is an almost uh, control of of the narrative that emerges surrounding the subject of slavery. While it acknowledges taboo subjects uh, and it provides a space to contain the discussion, which is separate from the National Museum, where images of slaves are presented and depicted, but the subject itself is not covered, even in key industries uh, that are discussed, including pearling. And Instead, what you see in the Qatar National Museum is, uh, is a discussion of the creation, rise, and history of the current state of the country. Um, and through this kind of isolation of the controversial topics that include histories of labor, histories of slavery, and even histories of, uh, of an area that's basically been demolished and rebuilt, uh, his, of, which are of social significance, uh, social and economic significance. What you see is an ability to uh, to isolate and control a kind of a certain master narratives that, for example, enter school textbooks or are depicted on television and, and in other platforms or are retold during National Day celebrations. And the and this latest National Museum. Uh, and in addition. This is not, the Slavery Museum is not the primary museum you'll find students visiting. They're, they're visiting the National Museum. Tourists are primarily visiting the National Museum. It's the site in which it's located is right on the Corniche. It's, you know, next to Sugwagaf. It's, even though the Mshera Museums are also by Sugwagaf, they're kind of in a corner. You don't really know they're there unless you're, <laughs> you're directly looking for them. Uh, and that it's not given this front and center approach that other museums are. So in one of the opening exhibits, which is entitled Slavery in the World, it's examining slavery from antiquity to the medieval Mediterranean, and the rest of the exhibit pertaining to slavery in the region are abstracted to figures, locations, and generalizations with regards to topics such as religious perspectives on slavery and the role of slavery in economic and social, particularly zar and musical life. Even from preliminary conversations with uh, certain, certain members in this room, <laughs> um, uh, we have interviews which were conducted and recollections which were, uh, which were documented and experiences which were told, but a conscious choice was made not to include them in, within the exhibits itself. And this is potentially, in my reading, due to cultural sensitivities, uh, whatever that means, <laughs> um, uh, which is, a, which is a, something that I think most societies battle with is what what emerges, what comes in front, and what is hidden. 
Instead, there's a heavy reliance on British archival sources, and when the voices of the enslaved were heard, they were through snippets of quotations from manumission testimonies embedded in its exhibit descriptions, uh, discussions of their economic contributions, uh, which are highlighted in industries that are primarily non no longer existent, pearling, agriculture, domestic labor, and only one of uh, and only one line mentions their participation in the petroleum industry. And completely unmentioned in the following museum, which is dedicated to labor in the petroleum industry, none of this is mentioned, and none of this is further explored. The reality is that there were numerous instances which their labor was used to the knowledge of locals and British officials. Instead, we see the museum framed from the beginning and end exhibit with the positioning of slavery as a global, beyond the Indian Ocean phenomenon. Only one interview is actually shown uh, directly with a person who was formerly enslaved. So the first exhibit you, or the first exhibits you have engage with uh, slavery and antiquity in the pre-modern world and it concludes with modern trafficking, so from labor to sex. Beyond this museum, slavery isn't mentioned at all. In no other of the Mushirab House museums uh, is, this, are, is this discussed or is this mentioned, and it's not mentioned explicitly in the National Museum, even though visually it is there. And similarly, in the Zabara, you don't see this either. <laughs> Uh, it consists of a fort in a village which has previously become, uh, which has become part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, a spectacle that's to play a key role due to its utility to add to the mythology of a new national narrative with the significance placed on the site as one of the major battles by whom is, uh, by whom is now considered the country's founder, uh, Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad al Thani, um, and how the state in itself was established according to this narrative. In a similar vein, in Zanzibar, uh, to the Tony Palace ruins, you have a Zabara, which is an open-air museum, and taking on this, this format. And according to archaeologists during a site visit, which I attended with, uh, <laughs> with one of our uh, organizers, uh, Professor Abushara, the aim was to connect the pearl diving and trading history of Azabara to Al Dafna, uh, which is the urban center, and the emphasizing an economic and nationalistic history of the country, which is founded on development and conceptions of development and economic development. Ideas that were circulating among archaeological ex and excavation teams at the sites during the process, during the excavation process in general, is to turn the site into a live experience to provide an authentic experience for the visitor, which would include horses and camels and a functioning date press, although this hasn't happened so far, but it was on the original posters for the site. For the site ideas, you know, I was taking photos around the, uh, around the little porta cabins that they had around there, and I took photos of all their brainstorming ideas that they had. <laughs> Uh, these only follow in the footsteps of the amusement park style open air museums that they were conceiving of of how to how to develop uh, this kind of uh, this kind of a site. When I directly asked the lead archaeologist showing us the site about underrepresented populations, women were not at all featured within this conversation, nor were slaves. He only passingly made reference to remains of temporary housing structures that were found which they suspect would have housed slaves, and no mention at all of the slaves who contributed to the industries of the economies that they wish to highlight, particularly pearling. And the only mention of women were the seclusion behind barriers, when, which in itself was not a summation based on any concrete research or evidence. And it was presuppositions that were, that were made. And uh, as we're running out of time to conclude, each of these sites presents a different approach to representations of slavery in the Indian Ocean, and how each connects to a national narrative. In the Zanzibari case, we see a situation where the second most dominant industry has taken control over the narrative and has aided in reinforcing Tanzanian and Zanzibari views of history, national history, and reinforcing the constructed racial divides. Qatar adopts a slightly different approach, but reaches a similar conclusion, where in this case, a reluctance of placing slavery and its impacts, arguably within a position of prominence within the major national museums, also serves to reinforce a national narrative that benefits the state. And in both of these instances, the same international bodies, 
NGOs, UNESCO, are adopted as a tool to provide legitimacy to these narratives and are the same ones that also replicate themselves across the world of slave memorial museums. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Al Johara. Um, our next presentation today by Professor Beatrice Nicolini is titled Fake News or Strategic Menaces in the Gulf and in the Indian Ocean, rereading a few 19th century British archive documents. Please, Beatrice. Can I just take this off? Yes. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm not tall enough to stay <laughs> behind this because you are not going to see me. Um, first of all, I really would like to thank uh, the conveners, the organizers, because this is a huge meeting, and especially for me, it's uh, moving. I believe uh, the right definition is from darkness to light, because the last time we met with some of you, it was 2020, and we were all together in Doha, in Qatar, in a beautiful conference. And after that, everything, I mean, went down, um, as it, Italian, we have been um, experiencing the worst months, the worst years in terms of COVID attack, in terms of uh, death people, and also uh, personally myself, I survived to uh, breast cancer which has been the hugest challenge inside the pandemic. So it's really uh, coming out from hell this morning for me is quite a miracle. So thank you very much. And um, this is really a prestigious occasion. I, I, well, I, I believe also uh, European universities, and especially my university, uh, could be uh, very happy to be involved in this initiative of the journal, of this institute, because uh, we have now uh, many, many students that are very much interested in learning extra-European languages, international topics. So, uh, well, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of my magnificent rector, but I, I believe that he would really be happy to, I mean, open uh, new relationships and hopefully agreements with uh, this institution that might be very positive collaboration. Uh, yes. Yes, so... Um, Today, I would like just to uh, present a, a research that might be interesting uh, in terms of what is actually uh, happening today. Because, you know, uh, the Indian Ocean uh, today is quite experiencing sort of, you know, fake news and conflicts, especially on land area. And this is a, let's call it discovery, uh, of a group of manuscripts from the British archives. Because I, I was starting searching about this period uh, between the last of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. And I was always reading the literature about this topic and I was just alluding the famous Napoleon's intercepted letters. And then I was always searching for the sources and there were no sources. So I just wondering why uh, we couldn't find the, the, 
the sources of the, this famous interceptor letter. So I, I went to UK and this was really, because in life you need luck. So, <laughs> and it was really a luck because I just ordered the wrong um, folio, the wrong archive and I wrote for instead of, of first or vice versa. I don't remember because now I'm very old. And they brought me this archive, this manuscript, and the title was The French in India. And I said, listen, I didn't order that. I opened it and I said, this is unbelievable. I just put all my research in the basket and I started from the very beginning because I discovered, by luck, the English translation of Napoleon's letter. So we are going back to the end of the 18th century, uh, to the beginning of the 19th century, with this huge expedition by Napoleon to Egypt, because the idea was invading India. The reason why Napoleon wished to invade India was that he realized that it was almost impossible to invade Britain from France, because at the period we know that the most powerful maritime global empire was Britain. Therefore, he decided to, from, uh, from Spain to travel to Egypt, which has been an important expedition that we know in terms of uh, archeology, span in terms of discoveries. And he decided to write a letter to uh, different, uh, uh, local uh, political leaderships that were involved in this strategy. The strategy was organized both by land and by sea because Napoleon made an alliance with the Tsar Alexander I through an emissary, through an ambassador, through a spy who was Antoine Gardin at the court of Tehran in Persia in order to organize the chivalry through the north, which has always been, as we know, the, the dream, the idea of reaching the warm sea. And it's unbelievable that today we, we are experiencing this idea from Russia, which never goes away, of trying to penetrate the southern part of the Federation today, which is something that is endless. And the other way of this strategy was writing these letters to the Sheikh of Mecca, to Tipu Sultan of Mysore in India, because it was one of the last uh, Indian states that was not submitted to the British Dominion, and it was an enclosure for Sultan bin Ahmed al Busaid of Oman. The proposal was this one that you see. This is the English translation, but then we have the French uh, original version. And it, the proposal was allying with France and Great Britain in order to free them from the iron joke <laughs> of Britain. Uh, the truth is that all these famous interceptor letters never reached their destinations because they were intercepted they were kept by a spy in Mocha in Yemen, translated into English, and sent in two places, Mumbai today, Bombay Presidency, and London. We all know because 
of the monsoon, because of the navigation in the Indian Ocean, that it was very easy to communicate very fast between Arabia and Asia, between India and Africa in the Indian Ocean, 12, 15 days with the favorable monsoon. But it was very complicated to communicate with UK. And it took a letter, could take even six months. So the space and time inside this strategy were fundamental because this letter, when they reach the destination, and we don't know if this letter really existed, if this letter really reached the destination, but nevertheless, they just modify all the defense policy of the British presence in the Indian Ocean. And the French Minets didn't stop despite Napoleon left Egypt for Spain and then he proclaimed himself emperor in 1845 because the French interests remain very high, very active inside many ports in the Indian Ocean. One huge alarm, one necessity, was learning what was between Persia and India. Because the British fear was an invasion of a French army. Therefore, all the defense policy in this area has been modified not because of local realities, but because of an external European menace. And this reaction uh, gave life to uh, new discoveries, new expeditions, for example, of a region that is today between Pakistan and Iran, that is Baluchistan, where I have been uh, working on field work uh, and personally visited all the coasts between uh, Jiwani, which is the last village because, before the border with Iran, because we didn't have the visa to travel to Iran, to uh, Gwadar and then to Karachi. So all this coast has been searched and studied by an Italian mission international group. And the first explorations were directed to create a new political borders because uh, the, the local leaderships were defined to be much more uh, reliable when divided in states and not in tribal areas and not in nomad population. And what we see today in the divisions of the political borders of uh, many of these regions are because of this interceptor letter, because of this presumed French minais in the Indian Ocean. So it's not something, I mean, this fake news, this letter, is not something that we just, you know, fine because it's funny, because it's different, because it gives you the survival in the academia, but it's because you can connect it. <laughs> this is one of the, our main objects, because it is connecting the present to the past. Uh, of course, Tipu Sultan, was defeated in 1799 in the Battle of Sirangapatam in a huge massacre by the British and the last of these um, resisting emperors of Western India lasted. And now we just 
I'm not going to keep you a long time because I know that we are very close to lunch. We are all tired because we crossed the world. And so this is one of my goal, not taking you that much. Uh, yes, there is another group of manuscripts, of documents, which simply um, kept my attention because I am Italian and I found an Italian spy in the Indian Ocean, <laughs> which is something quite unique. And uh, uh, actually, uh, this is also another group of documents named Mascar Intercepted French Paper. Because this David Vatran, or Vatran, uh, according to the translations, he was suspected of acting for the French against the British presence. So he was supposed to be an Italian from Naples. Uh, in Italy is a, a state from the second half of the 19th century, so we are not a United States in terms of historical period, and every city in the country had different administrations, different politics, different states, and he was supposed to come from this uh, political state of Naples and acting for the French against the British. Um, this Italian spy was able to come close to uh, Said Said bin Sultan al Busaid, who was really a revolutionary prince of his epoch because we know uh, he um, invested and he risked in moving the capital from Muscat in Oman to Zanzibar in order to enlarge his dominion in order also to enlarge the economy. And uh, he was able to move himself between the British and the French for a long time in order to find allies against his personal enemies, in order to find new ways of um, trading, and also, uh, as this morning, we had uh, other um, speakers that were talking about the huge theme of slave trade and slavery, which is most important for this region. And not only, obviously, because when we talk about slavery, we talk about the world. And luckily, it's not a theme just confined to one region. We know that. And uh, of course, um, there were many pressures from um, the British representatives against slave trade, uh, but I believe it's also important, especially when we talk about this topic in, in Europe, to remember that this idea that uh, abolishing slavery was something uh, just uh, limited to Europeans, it's not true, because inside the Muslim world, we have many scholars, many representatives that are acting against slave trade as well. So it's not something merely uh, coming from Europe. And this group of documents, trying to reach fast the conclusion, revealed to be not true, because this Italian spy was claiming to represent France, and uh, he was discovered by Jonathan Duncan, the governor, to be, and is defined in the document, political swindler. He was just trying to get paid, which is something that we can understand, <laughs> because it's difficult even today and he was claiming an identity that he never had in reality. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite Professor Sandra Richards to the podium now to um, uh, speak about all these papers um, and to uh, give us some comments. If we have time for Q&A, uh, we'll turn to that. But if not, uh, we can perhaps return to conversation of these papers in the next panel. Please, Professor Richards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here, uh, particularly since I've um, pretty much just arrived. Um, but one thing I do want to mention just very briefly, that um, when I first received the invitation and went on the website to look at the Africa Institute, I was so pleased and touched to see that there is a um, um, Tejumolo Olanian uh, Fellowship. And um, for me, that, that strikes um, a place that's very personal because um, I met Teju many years ago in Nigeria when I was doing uh, research on the playwright Femi Oshopisong. And Teju was, um, was very supportive then. And so it was a surprise, a wonderful surprise, to see this co connection between um, research um, focusing on Arabs and research focusing on, uh, on Africans, po possibly focusing on Africans coming together here. So um, to those of you who uh, have been instrumental in that and getting that fellowship um, and that program, Thank you, thank you. Um, I have um, some, um, some comments that are a little bit more extensive than others because um, some papers I received ahead of time and the others I did not. Um, but um, one of the things that um, I think from what I've heard um, this morning is um, that the, um, the interdisciplinary work that is uh, potential here is so exciting, and I hope that that can be um, continued. Um, for um, example, um, if I would, can start with um, Matthew Hopper, whose work I've, uh, I've used um, in some of my own research. Um, I um, wondered whether there were any records kept by employers of these supposedly indentured um, people. And similarly, when you um, showed us the contract, that raised for me the question, well, who's contracting <laughs> what? And what are the obligations um, that um, those who are um, buying labor, what obligations do they have? And how are people contracted, the laborers, able to um, try to get um, some rectification uh, of their, their um, con uh, of, of the conditions. Um, and that for me raises um, another question that it, it seems to me that um, that this topic um, is, is ripe to approach from a number of different um, areas. Um, for example, um, because I've also recently been introduced to um, Dr. Gita Sidi, um, who is a, a, a performer whom you will um, see tonight. T tonight, yes. <laughs> I don't know what day it is, what time it is. Yes, you'll see her at some point. Um, wondering um, what about um, perceptions from those people who were indentured? What kinds of records um, do we have? And um, I recognize that you're a historian, um, and so that um, perhaps do, do not deal in, in maybe in, in oral literatures, in um, maybe in creative literature that's based upon um, um, some um, archival texts, or even more recently, I read an article um, about um, culinary practices in South Africa. Um, that are both um, Indian um, and African. So that um, it seems to me that, that some of the ways, pr I wonder whether we can get some of the voices of those people who were enslaved or indentured into the conversation 
whether um, performance in terms of um, um, oral histories, traditions, stories, uh, recreations, whether that's um, whether those kinds of disciplines are ways in which we might be able to get um, a fuller, um, perhaps a fuller history, or an opportunity for um, um, the silenced people to um, to speak. Um, and. Um, let's see, I think in terms of moving along um, that I will um, go next to, um, to Al Jawara's um, paper on um, the a wonderful paper on the contrast between um, the Zanzibari um, museums on, um, on slavery and um, the Qatar um, Museum. Um, one of the questions um, I would have um, um, in both places, I would love to see at some point um, uh, information on the kind of training that guides have, um, because it seems to me that in the Zanzibar context, um, that, that I think you're very right in talking about it in terms of um, a kind of Disney approach, a low-tech Disney approach, um, where there's a certain kind of theatricality that has to, um, it, it, my reading of it, having been, been to Zanzibar, a certain kind of theatricality has to be performed in order to hold people's attention um, and get more people to, um, to, to come um, to those sites. So I would, would wonder what kind of guide training do they, um, do, do they receive? I also wonder um, what kind of, of training perhaps or materials are generated for schools. And for me, this question comes about by, by virtue of having um, studied Benjil Mood and know that there is a robust educational program that's going on in Qatar. Um, and um, also, um, I think that we probably would want to have uh, a more nuanced discussion, and I realize you, you know, that you're pressed for time, a nuanced discussion of what this term uh, tourist means. Uh, you know, who are the tourists? Yes, they have to have a certain amount of money to leave from wherever they, <laughs> they live to end up in Zanzibar or to end, end up in Qatar. Yes, so that we know that they have a certain amount of money, but we don't necessarily know what kind of education um, <laughs> they have. Um, and um, that, I think, would be um, also important, um, important too. Um, you, and I, I, and I, I do believe that, that it's, it's important, the, the kind of contrast that, that you provide in terms of, um, because Zanzibar um, is marketing um, itself in this way towards, uh, more towards tourists, there's a way in which, at least in what, in what tourists encounter, um, there's less perhaps a reflection on what the issue means for, the Zan for Zanzibaris themselves. Um, and the opposite, it seems to me, is the case, may be the case for folks in, in, in Qatar, um, that it's much more of a, of a question of Qatari society of you know of what does it mean um, having this um, acknowledgement this house house of slavery and I'll just say very um, quickly that when I presented a paper um, at a, um, a conference um, a couple of years ago well maybe now almost five years ago on the Benjamin Mood House I didn't know that I was lighting a fire <laughs> because the first question that came up is who wants to remember slavery um, in, um, in in, in, in the Middle East. I mean, you know, why are, we, why are you doing this? Um, and it is, it's a very familiar question. Um, it, was a, it was a question um, that certainly was raised in the U.S. Um, when people started um, instituting um, slave um, um, muse museums. And, and a question that continues. Um, certainly in the U.S., um, given our, um, I guess, sort of present movement um, against people, particularly children, feeling bad in school, so therefore we shouldn't teach history. Um, <laughs> uh, um, that, that, that's understandable. Um, 
for uh, Beatrice uh, Nicolini, uh, I thank you um, for your um, paper. Um, you've introduced me to, um, so, uh, to an area that I know very, very uh, little about. Uh, so that one of um, my questions about your use of fake news, you answered it in one way by uh, talking about the fact that this presumed menace has implications um, for the borders of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of these countries. But I guess I would still wonder whether the, yes, certainly the term fake news catches our interest, but whether it's um, um, also problematic, at least uh, my sense of, of fake news, uh, as we understand it perhaps in the US, that it also presumes um, a public, um, a citizenry, um, who have a certain amount of power, how they are able to, um, to vote, um, how they're able to vote. And um, I don't think you're talking, um, you're not talking about um, any, any voters or, or a, a, the general populace that has um, recourse um, to, to counter what, what, what rulers are doing. So, so I just sort of um, wonder, uh, wonder about that. Um, Let's see, I think those are the questions uh, or comments that I want to offer, offer now. Um, but I guess, I guess, again, I would um, go back to that um, I believe that these papers um, show us a, uh, an opportunity for further collaboration and, and collaboration that's interdisciplinary and multi-disciplinary. Multi, uh, Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we do have some time. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, so we'd like to open the floor to questions and comments. We also have uh, microphone, so perhaps you could wait a moment for the mic to arrive, but uh, please, uh, yeah, we'll try to take as many questions as possible. Oh, of course, yes. Would, would anyone like to respond to, to uh, Professor Reacher's comments first? Yes, absolutely, that's fine. Please, sorry. Okay, thank you. What is a rich set of you know, comments and questions? So my question is for Matthew Harper. And this is an invitation for you to elaborate on two sets of you know, queries. The first one has to do with the other uh, contributing factors uh, for the impact of scientific racism on the abolitionist strategy? Are there technological, cultural, and political uh, factors that you can elaborate on? Or is it just the sheer number of pseudoscientists that made that possibility, the possibility of impacting you know, the abolitionist uh, uh, project? And the second one has to do with you providing a textured account of the kinds of narratives that may have impacted negatively the abolitionist project, because I didn't, I didn't hear specific examples. So could you give us an example about that paradoxical you know, strategy? Thank you. And I just want to say quickly that Beatrix's fake news was both intriguing and distracting at the same time. So, because I was intrigued, but then I thought that it just didn't do justice to the project. Thank you. Uh, hi, <coughs> I'm Ahmed Al Mazmi, a PhD candidate at Princeton. Thank you all for your engaging uh, papers. Uh, my question to Matthew: uh, I would like you to say more about how the scholarship on East Africa during the 19th century was feeding into the discourse of uh, scientific racism. Was it archaeology? Was it historiography? What was it that made these abolitionists think of um, these uh, liberated Africans as inferior or incapable? 
of being good, um, uh, you know, active citizens maybe, or, or uh, of, of value to the societies they're joining. Um, and for Johara, uh, I will say follow the money. If you, if you actually look at who finances Zanzibari uh, Slavery Museum, uh, <coughs> uh, the Christian engineers uh, were behind it. I don't know who they are. Uh, in the Qatari case, it's the state, right? Um, and both of them are invested in different ways in these, uh, sorry? Yeah, um, and they're invested in different ways in, in these discourses uh, where you don't find, for example, the liberated Africans, you know, and the way they were treated, exhibited in Zanzibar. And in Qatar, the discourse around citizenship, broadly speaking, is not part of that discourse as well. So I would like you to think of in those terms whether these um, uh, patrons of these museums are also shaping these discourses. Thank you all. Thank you very much for these uh, very helpful uh, questions and, uh, and interventions. So uh, I'll respond first to the question uh, about the other contingencies and other contributing factors. Um, what I'm arguing in the broader project is that what's happening in the Indian Ocean is not happening in a vacuum. It's seen in the broader context of what's also happening in the Atlantic. So the anti-slavery campaign in the Indian Ocean is following but is also simultaneous with the anti-slave trade campaign on the coast of West Africa and in the Caribbean. And so I think what's happening is it's, uh, it's later but it's being influenced by earlier experiences in the Caribbean. Number one, the perceived failure of abolition in the Caribbean in terms of the, the production of sugar. So the economic consequences of abolition are seen uh, especially by labor movements in England um, as really out of touch, that abolitionists are arguing for, uh, uh, for uh, apprenticeship and, uh, and for abolition at the very same time that industrializing Britain is, uh, work, labor conditions are, are uh, extremely difficult for laborers within England. So there's a declining membership in abolitionist societies the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica, I think, is also a, a, a transformative moment. And following Im almost immediately after the, the, the Indian mutiny, I, I think these kinds of global experiences of imperialism are influencing uh, abolitionism back home. But they're, as you mentioned, also simultaneous with archeological uh, discoveries uh, that are now bringing into question the antiquity of the earth and the question of the unity of humanity. So it is interesting to think that from classical antiquity right on through medieval times, it was assumed in Christian and Islamic societies alike that all humans trace their lineage back to a common ancestor. And this is called into question uh, beginning in the 1850s and be actually even preceding uh, Darwin's work that uh, human remains found in situ with um, now extinct animals in Torquay Cave in 1858. This is happening simultaneous to the captures of slave ships in the Indian Ocean in 1858. And so uh, you asked, uh, Ahmed asked also about uh, events in East Africa also contributing. And I think the widespread popularity of the writings of some of the captains of these anti-slavery ships who are clearly exhibiting very racist tendencies toward the enslaved Africans who are their wards, who are, you know, they're, they are supposed to be caring for them and they're using a very pejorative language to describe them. I think in many ways they're playing back to an audience back in Europe that is ready to receive this kind of uh, scientific racism because uh, the ground has already been laid through archeology span and through science. So I think it's all feeding into, it's a feedback loop that the Indian Ocean is sort of getting into uh, a bit later, but I think it's par part of the same uh, process. So anyway, I'll let my colleagues respond to uh, those comments as well. So thank you to uh, Professor Sander Richards and uh, 
to the audience comments and questions. Uh, I appreciate actually the uh, discussion surrounding education because that is key, particularly you know in in Qatar. I'm I'm more familiar with the curriculum that's uh, that's been developed there. But also, it is uh, definitely worth considering uh, what is happening on the school level. I'm more familiar with what's happening on the, at the university level, where tourism is actually uh, one of the key majors that is being taught, or one of the few key majors that's being taught at Zanzibar State University. Um, and so, a lot of uh, these narratives are being perpetuated through even the education system. Uh, that's being presented at the university, and it's uh, part of public discourse, uh, very much so when it comes to how uh, they engage with how how they engage with this history, at least to foreign visitors. Uh, when it, I haven't done extensive field work there due to time constraints, um, so this is definitely something to look into into how uh, narratives may shift depending on who they speak to and, and who is being addressed in, uh, in this particular conversation. Uh, concerning the money, again, the, you know, the Qatari context is, uh, is more explicit uh, when it comes to the Zanzibari context as well because there are various sites. Um, some are national and others are uh, privately funded. Um, so these are also playing into similar narratives and I think it's very interesting that you bring up the point of uh, I, the Anglican Church, was it? That's uh, the Christian Engineers, uh, which actually is interesting because that's the only site that has a slightly different narrative that's going on within, uh, within some of the exhibits that are being shown. So definitely something to consider, and thank you for that point. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, going back f uh, for a while to this uh, topic, I, I believe that this interdisciplinary way of dealing with the slave trade in East Africa has been uh, influenced very much also by the religious aspect. Uh, because one of the main reasons why um, the Berlin Conference in 1885 eased the possessions by European powers of the time of the African continent was the religious aspect, bringing the light of the pagan world. This idea of, of conversion is very strong in Europe during the 19th century. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I agree. I mean, this idea of the fake news is today very much attached to public opinion which obviously didn't exist in the 19th century. But I just thought it was uh, a way of re-reading, re-interpreting an over Minais, a strategic and land of my time Minais, which probably was not that real, not that um, co concrete as it, it realized. And uh, this alarm contributed to modify not only the sea routes, but also the land distribution, which is a huge topic for the Indian Ocean, probably um, not enough developed even today. So we might need more research in terms of relationships between land and maritime issues. And this um, 18, especially 18, Ten explorations uh, contributed to give a perception of this area, which is still today focused on India. Because all the interests also in East Africa were mainly directed to protect Asia. And if you think about uh, contemporary policies, Always, Asia comes before Africa in many, many issues, even uh, development issues today. So this is something very deep in the memory of the people of the Indian Ocean, where British policy especially, uh, especially simply because I have been studying it more, was focused on the protection of the most precious colony that was India. 
So the, the idea of a French Minais is something that is deeply modifying all political borders for the region, which revealed to be probably not that dangerous. Also because Napoleon left Egypt back to Europe and the ports, I mean, the, the commercial ports for France didn't get the importance that got Britain also because of the naval power shift. Thank you.